This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome, church family. Rick Warren has a quote. We are created for community, fashioned for fellowship, formed for a family, and none of us can fulfill God's purposes by ourselves. Thank you for being here. We love you. Yeah, let's uh, begin today with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you love us, that you've invited us here. I thank you that every person is in this room or watching on television or online because you want it to happen. And Lord, you have a word for us, not only through the sermon, but through the, the stories, the interview, the music. Lord, we pray that everybody would leave here full of joy, full of life, with fresh vision, ready to be peacemakers and joy bringers. Lord, we thank you that you've done that to us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. Preparation for Bobby's message, the words of our Lord, found in Mark 10, 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. 
Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am being baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles rule it over them, lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Church family, we are striving to make our work environments great by being servant leaders. Amen. Dear God, it is our heart's desire that these songs are pleasing to your ear, that we can embrace what it means to minister to your, to your heart with these songs, with these melodies. So we give you all the glory. May your presence come and fill this place. May you inhabit our praise. We give you all the glory. In your precious name, we all said, amen. Bye. 
Amen. Let's put our hands together for the greatness of God this morning. Yes. Hello, church family. In this new year, I want you to know that God is a healer. Everywhere he goes, he brings healing with him. In fact, in 1 Peter 2.24, God says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By His wounds, you have been healed. Friend, God has forgiven your sins. He has removed the shame of your past from your future, and He wants to heal your body, your brokenness, and your hurt, so that you can be a source of healing to others. But sometimes in our effort to have faith for God to move in our lives, we don't accept our current reality. But faith without works is dead. We need to be the kind of people who trust that with God's help, we will 100% prevail in the end. But we also need enough discipline to look at our current reality and not become overwhelmed by our circumstances. With God's guidance, He gives you the power to change any area of your life. There is no tragedy God cannot redeem. He redeems death. He redeems sickness, and He can redeem all of the hurt you're facing in your life. You, child of God, can be healthy, healed, and whole. God wants to redeem and heal you today. I want to encourage you to take a step today and request these resources, which are filled with some scripture truths to build your faith and turn your hurt into healing. I pray that you allow the messages and content to seep into your heart and your mind and watch as God starts working miraculously in your life. And remember always, God loves you and so do I. With us today, we have Dr. Brandon Lane Phillips and Jeremy Miller. Brandon was born with a congenital heart defect. This is Brandon, which resulted in him receiving a life-changing wish, which actually was to be Jeremy, right? That's correct. So Jeremy Miller is best known for his role as Ben Seaver on the 1980s hit show Growing Paints. Uh, Jeremy was a huge part of uh, Growing Paints fans. Jeremy was a huge part of Brandon's Wish, and their friendship is documented in their new book, When I Wished Upon a Star, and it's a terrific book. Would you welcome Thank with you. me Brandon and Jeremy. Hi, guys. Thank you for having what us. What a joy. <laughs> what a joy to see you and to meet you. Well, this is a, an, a, just a great story. Um, first of all, please tell me a little bit, like, you had this heart, congenital heart defect, you're a kid, life was hard for you in many ways, and you had this one wish, it's kind of like a Make-A-Wish Foundation type thing, and you wanted to meet Jeremy from Growing Pains, or Ben from Growing Pains, I guess, the character, but uh, tell, tell me about all that and what that experience was like and how that happened. Well, when I was 11 years old, um, I just felt like God didn't love me. He gave me a heart defect. Um, and then just my family situation just was not what I wanted it to be. I wanted a family situation more like I saw Ben have on Growing Pains. Yeah. So as a kid, I just remember when I prayed, God, if you love me, show me that you love me. And I knew that I was getting a wish. And when I got to meet Jeremy, one of Jeremy's first questions to me was, where do you go to church? And this little bell went off in my head. And it's like, I'm not, you know, I think maybe God is answering my prayer in, in a way. And later that evening, Jeremy had a younger brother, had to leave the set right after the show. But his older brother on the show, Kirk Cameron, spent some time with me talking to me about how much God loved me and had a plan for my life. I'm not sure that Kirk knew that God's plan included him and Jeremy for my life at the time. Yeah. Um, but we've actually all kind of been friends over the last 
30 something years. So do you actually, I mean, there was a lot going on in your life at the time, this big show and all that stuff every day. And you know, I know what it's like to be on a TV show. I mean, everything's crazy. Do you actually remember meeting Brandon? I, I remember... do. I, I remember the day I got to meet Brandon very clearly. First of all, he was the only kid who ever came to the show as a wish kid just to meet me. Uh, yeah. You know, I was the little brother. So it was, I was usually third or fourth in line on that list. So that I remembered as well as, again, we didn't get a lot of information, so as far as I knew, I was meeting a young boy who might not be here very long, and I just wanted to give him the best day I could. And we just kind of formed a friendship that, you know, has lasted over the years. How was that day? Was it as good as you hoped it would be as a kid? Oh my goodness, it was so much fun. Like, we stole golf carts, as mom says, we borrowed. <laughs> Um, you know, we went and jumped out of a barn. I had just had a heart procedure like two weeks before. My mom, if my mom had any idea wow. what I had done that day, she would not have been happy with Jim. We didn't tell her till much later. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure that that had to raise your spirits. And I mean, being, you know, I'm sure it had to help your health then even, even still because you're in a better place. And, and actually you ended up becoming a cardiologist. Right. I, I think one of the big things that that day did for me, it's like if I could go from my little town in Louisiana to meet these people that I could, I see every week on my TV show, then I could pretty much do anything. Mm -hmm. And I'd actually failed first grade, was tested for special education in kindergarten, but from the time of my wish forward, I started to do really, really well in school. So wow. meeting Jeremy really had a profound impact on my life. Well, and I would think that even as a cardiologist too, I mean, that's pretty amazing. It's a, it's a hard, difficult specialty to be in. I mean, you, did you say you studied at Mayo Clinic or UCLA or something like that? Or? I, I did. I did my um, residency and fellowship at Texas Children's Hospital and, and Mayo Clinic, and I got to train with the very physicians who had taken care of me throughout my childhood, which was just wow. kind of a wish, wish come true in itself. So you guys have become great friends, and you found a, there's these points in your life where in God's providence, you just keep running into each other and then developed almost like a family friendship. That's, Tell me a little bit more about that. I mean, he, you were there for when he needed you, but he was there when you needed him one yeah, time too, right? Much later on, I mean, that really is what this book is about is our stories and our journey together, but it's how God has placed us in each other's lives when we've needed it the most. Uh, when I was at the depths of my addiction to alcohol, Brandon was very crucial in helping me get sober. He actually kind of uh, vouched for me with the CEO of the recovery program that I was going into as a very limited program and it was very hard to get into and Brandon let him know and it was the deciding factor to see. He told, I, I got to work with that recovery program for years afterwards and he told me for years that the deciding factor was Brandon stepping up and saying I was worth saving. Wow. Wow, what so an awesome it, uh, story. This is, this is my brother, you know, over here. I mean, we see, really are a, you know, family. You really are, right? Like you guys, you, sell, you see each other all, all the time. You, you're, oh, yeah. Your moms, oh. you know each other's moms. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, my, his mom's my mom. Yeah. I, mean, they, I talk to her, he talks to my mom. We, awesome. we are just a big family. What do you, you know, so the, this story is so great and it, it gets even better, but I, what, what do you hope that those who are hearing the interview now, and especially those who read your book, When I Wished Upon a Star, what, what do you hope that they will get from the book? For me, it's just, you know, the, what I've seen in my life is that God is always working in our life, even when we can't see it, especially when we can't see it and when it seems the darkest to us. And, you know, God may not give us what we want, and most of the time we don't have a clue what that is anyway. Mm -hmm. So he always seems to put who and what we need there when we need it. Yeah. And I've experienced that throughout my life, and I just want people to, to be able to feel that hope through this book. It's a good word. Feel the same way, Brandon? Abs absolutely. I think that's the main thing. It's God just keeps showing up. Sometimes it's you know through Jeremy. Sometimes it's through Kirk. Sometimes it's through family. But no matter where I am in life, God just shows up and he's there and he provides what I need when I need it. It's awesome. Such a great story. Dr. Brandon Lane Phillips, Jeremy Miller. The book is called When I Wished Upon a Star. Guys, thank you so much for being here thank today. What so a much. great and encouraging great. story. Having we love you and appreciate you. Thank you, guys. God bless you. you, guys. God bless. Take care.
Hello, church family. In this new year, I want you to know that God is a healer. Everywhere He goes, He brings healing with Him. In fact, in 1 Peter 2.24, God says, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By His wounds, you have been healed. Friend, God has forgiven your sins. He has removed the shame of your past from your future, and He wants to heal your body, your brokenness, and your hurt, so that you can be a source of healing to others. But sometimes in our effort to have faith for God to move in our lives, we don't accept our current reality. But faith without works is dead. We need to be the kind of people who trust that with God's help, we will 100% prevail in the end but we also need 
enough discipline to look at our current reality and not become overwhelmed by our circumstances. With God's guidance, He gives you the power to change any area of your life. There is no tragedy God cannot redeem. He redeems death, He redeems sickness, and He can redeem all of the hurt you're facing in your life. You, child of God, can be healthy, healed, and whole. God wants to redeem and heal you today. I want to encourage you to take a step today and request these resources, which are filled with some scripture truths to build your faith and turn your hurt into healing. I pray that you allow the messages and content to seep into your heart and your mind and watch as God starts working miraculously in your life. And remember always, God loves you and so do I. Friends, would you hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving? Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to hurry. I don't have to worry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Well, let me just tell you that uh, every once in a while when you uh, preach a sermon, you're truly preaching to a mirror. Um, a lot of my life was a life of powering up, of discovering that I didn't have to be pushed around, that I could, you know, by using a bigger voice, by being stronger, by doing some of these things, I could feel like a tougher guy. I could achieve what I wanted. I could push back evil. And so I, much of my life, was overcoming evil with power. 
uh, today. And so I just want to tell you that this is something even today I struggle with as, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about today is not overcoming evil with power, but overcoming evil with good, which of course is more power than the, the power the world teaches us about. And before we get into that, I just want to remind you we are in the, today is the last sermon in a series on Avoda. We ask the question, how can we find joy again in our work? How can we make it where the work that we do, the labor that we put our hands to, is life-giving? How can we make it where Monday through Friday isn't some horrible, you know, bad experience, so we're just working to some, you know, reward on the weekend, but that we actually enjoy Monday, where we look forward to going into work? And I believe that all of us can have that kind of experience in our work, where we can have a joyful, life-giving, wonderful experience no matter what we're, we're doing. Do you believe that too? So today I want to talk about this fantasy that many of us have. It's not a fantasy, but many of us, we dream about, what if I was at a workplace that was like, you know, when I look at Google and they have like a slide going down and they're in Palo Alto and it just looks awesome to work there. So often we think, what if I could, you know, find a place where I work and people are my friends and I enjoy going and I never want to leave. And I just want to encourage you that no matter where you are, that can be, that you can get to something like that. I think the reason that many of us desire this in our workplace is because the greatest human need is to bond. We have to bond with others, not just your spouse and your kids, although that's the most important. You need to bond with friends. You have to have people that you hang out with, people that you know will be there for you when you're going through a hard time, people you know that love you and think about you. It's very often when we go to work, we think, well, I can't have that here. You know, I can see how that's hard when you're a manager or a boss or, or whatever, but you can. You can have friends. I think this is one reason why uh, the show The Office was such a success. Anybody seen that show? Uh, it's ended in 2013, but it's maybe one of the most successful sitcoms ever. I think it ran eight seasons, and it is hilarious and pretty clean, actually. It's funny because this office is a copy of a British version, which was done by Ricky Gervais. The British version is a lot dirtier, a lot shorter, and a lot darker. So the first one really is almost a satire of just how horrible work is in general, how worthless it is how sad it is to go there. And, uh, and so the, the, the original show was very, just very, kind of a satire. And this one sort of starts that way. But then it takes this arc of like where it becomes less like this dark version and more like Cheers. Where these characters who are all very flawed and imperfect everyday people be, truly become good friends. It's such a simple premise. But the fact that it's maybe the most successful show, for sure one of the most successful shows in American television history, shows that it's, it's, a, it's something that maybe a lot of us want. What if I could go to work and, and have friends? What if I could go to work and enjoy it and love it? Well, today I want you to know that you can. And more, not only that you can, but that you might want to think about the idea that maybe it's God's calling on your life to be the first to do this. Very often we think, well, I'm not the boss, I can't do that. Or maybe if you're the boss, you think, well, I'm their boss, how could I be their friends? Well, we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk about how you can bring, you can be a, a peacemaker, a joy bringer, a servant leader, how in an environment that's competitive, that's dog eat dog, where people want title and position and money, that even though you can achieve those things as well, at first, you're a disciple of Christ and there's a way to love your competitors. We say, you know, love your enemies, but a lot of us don't have enemies, you know. We have competitors, though. And that's God's call for you today. I want to challenge you in that way. You ever been um, yourself overcome by good? Have you ever been kind of in a bad place? You're not feeling good emotionally, maybe you're really angry, or maybe you're depressed, or maybe you're just, you know, doing something that's flat out wrong. And someone's response, you know, the normal response to that when you're caught is authority, power, discipline. And that's not always bad. But sometimes you, you run into a teacher or a crazy uncle or it's something like that who confronts your evil with good. That's an, that's an awesome experience. I bet it would be really fun to sit down and hear those stories, especially as kids when we had you know, that grandma or that person who confronted our evil with good. 
One that always comes to my mind is when I started seminary. When I began at Fuller, I knew everything. Man, I was, I was a 25-year-old that knew everything. And uh, when the pastors at the, the church said, we're reformed, do you have to get an education? I said, I've got an education because I got the Bible. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I remember going into seminary, looking at all of these professors and all these students and just being like, I, 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 they don't have anything to teach me. It's terrible. I've grown since then. <laughs> and uh, no, but really, and just, and I'm actually embarrassed to say, to say all this, but I remember when one of my first systematic theology classes was taught by a really well-known uh, writer and thinker named Ray Anderson, very influential, studied under a famous theologian named T.F. Torrance. I think he went to St. Andrews. I'm looking at Tim, is that right? I don't know. But anyway, uh, maybe Cambridge. But he, he was just a just brilliant guy. And I was in his last class. He's now in his 80s. Everybody wants to take his class. I sort of stumbled into it randomly. And uh, I didn't know anything about this guy. I didn't care. I knew everything. And so I'm sitting there, and he's, it's a first class of systematic theology. And he's there preaching, or preaching, or teaching on something. And I start looking around. I'm like, are they hearing what he's saying? Are they hear What? What is he saying? What? And finally, in the middle of class, I full on stand up and I'm like, you're wrong. Like, just like, you know, I, I'm, I'm like, you, I, this is, I go, you are wrong. You can't say this. It's not true. It's not what the Bible says. And, you know, I'm going on and on and on like I'm, you know, I don't know, someone credible, and I'm not. And, uh, and it was great, is, is Ray just sort of sat there on a stool and listened, and then he would ask a question. And then I would answer, but not with so much verbosity, is that a word? I wasn't so, because I wasn't quite sure, and then he'd ask another question, and then I shrank a little more. <laughs> and uh, and what, what I realized, though, is, you know, in, in my bravado, is that I was a sucker, that this is what Ray did all the time, that all he did was bait stuck-up students like me. Uh, he was always the opposite of whatever you were. So if you were Calvinist, he was Arminian. If you were, you know, Baptist, he was Pentecostal. You know, whatever. Uh, and and uh, so he, he would do this to students to try and get them into this, into this mode. And he was so just kind and gracious to me and, and didn't embarrass me even though I felt embarrassed because I realized I didn't have all the answers to all the questions that as a pastor someday people would ask me. How often, by the way, do pastors lash out at congregants when they don't have the answer to a really good question? If only they had had a, a professor like Ray Anderson who didn't lash out back at them, but calmly, collectively, with joy in his heart, love and compassion and mercy, took their students out to Coco's, and that's what Ray did. He took me out to Coco's afterward and bought me some pie and calmed me down. That's a true story. Became a good friend and endorsed one of my books. Anyway, isn't it amazing when we have these memories of mothers and fathers in our life, spiritual mothers and fathers, who, who when we're angry, when we're obstinate, when we're powering up in their experience, their wisdom and love, they, they are peacemakers and joy bringers and servant leaders and teachers. And that's who you are, and I'm so proud of you. I'm actually so proud of this church because Hannah and I have been involved with a lot of churches. We really have. And I can tell you, not all of them were nice. Not all of them were good. Uh, and in, in all of our experiences, I would say this is one of the most joyful, peaceful, life-giving, Jesus-loving, calm, relaxed churches I've ever been to. And it's, it's one reason I, I love Shepherd's Grove so much. And Irvine Press is the same way, such loving Calm people. So that's who you are. Mark chapter 10, which Hannah read earlier. This is a passage about what it means to be truly great. The world has its answer, and then Jesus has an answer. First of all, in Jesus' day, he was uh, living in maybe the greatest empire in human history, famous the Roman Empire. And you can see your picture of the Roman Senate. This, was a, this is where all the power came from. This is where people were vying um, for authority, where Caesar was Caesar only because he had an army. It was in Rome, actually, that they would say things like, you're not truly wealthy unless you have a standing army. And so it was really just dog-eat-dog -dog and, and raw power. And uh, this was something that, 
This was a world in which the Jews, who are now a part of it, were sort of under the thumb of this Roman Empire. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, they are hearing one thing, even though he's saying another. This is a problem preachers have, by the way. Very often preachers will say something, and congregants will say, I'm so glad you talked about... You know, and then it's the opposite of whatever the preacher was talking about. And this, is, this is happening. I had a girl that cut my hair once. She visited church, and I was talking about something that had absolutely nothing to do with what she said. And, she, and someone read from a passage, or it was in a song, uh, Love is Not Rude. And she's like, I just love when you said love is not rude. And I was thinking, I didn't even say that. <laughs> Hannah did when she read the Anyway. And this is what's happening with Jesus preaching. He's talking about the kingdom of God and they're thinking something like Rome, something like Babylon, something like Persia, somewhere where this guy, Jesus, this rabbi, is going to establish a theocracy, an actual government. And he keeps saying plainly, this is not what I'm talking about. And, uh, and yet, here they are vying for power, for position, for title. And of course, all those things will mean money. So here it comes down in Mark chapter 10. It happens again. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were called sons of thunder, by the way. They were, they were very, like, you know, bold and powerful guys. They came to him and said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Already big ego. You see, like, they're coming to the, the, the guy in charge. We want to give, you know, what do you want for me to do, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. And he says, you don't know. And Jesus, the Bible says in Greek that Jesus literally went, <sighs> you know this kind of thing? <laughs> he says, you don't even know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am going to be baptized with? He's talking about the, the, the cross, by the way. And of course, without even thinking, these 20 something bravado sons of thunder said, We can't! You know, we can do it. And Jesus said to them, Well, you will drink the cup I drink, and you will be baptized, baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. Referring again to not only bap real baptism, but also crucifixion. He says, But to sit at my right hand or my left is not for me to grant. These Places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. Okay, then it says, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. You know why? Because they wanted those titles. They wanted those positions. They wanted those raises. They wanted that power. And now you've got all 12 disciples squabbling over who's going to have the title, who's going to have the position, who's going to have the power when Jesus overthrows Caesar. All right. Jesus called them together and said... Can we just pause here for a minute? Just, just for a minute. Did you know Jesus, I think, never refers to himself as Christ? He's referred to as Christ. The disciples call him Christ. He affirms that. He, he also, I don't believe, ever calls himself the Son of God. Although, again, he's called that and he affirms those. Jesus almost always calls himself the same thing. You know what it is? The Son of Man. The Son of Man. Now, when we hear that, we hear... He's a human being, and that's, that is what he's saying. But he's also referencing this very famous passage in Daniel chapter 7. Now, the, the story of Daniel is a, is a wonderful one. I mentioned him, I think, last week, where I said there's not a lot of perfect characters in the Bible, but Daniel's pretty darn close. What you see throughout the whole Old Testament is this promise that the son of Adam, which, or the son of man, is going to strike down the serpent. The son of Eve, right? He's going to strike down the serpent. And story after story of the Old Testament are stories of mostly men taking power and lording it over others, defining what is good and evil in their own heart, and then becoming like beasts themselves. So you have this, this sort of theme of beastliness about men as they're pursuing more power, more wealth, more control, and... Daniel, finally, in this dream at the end of the book of Daniel, says, I had this dream that those beasts, and it's referring to the nations of Babylon, the nations of Persia, probably the Akkadian Assyrian Empire, these beasts that had trampled everything, destroyed everything that was good, 
that the Ancient of Days, from his glorious throne, struck them down into the fire, referring to destroying these evil empires. And that then, to, up to the Ancient of Days, there was one called the Son of Man. So there's the Son of Man, this is a famous phrase, who in Daniel 7 steps on a glorious cloud and the cloud brings him up to a second throne by the Father where he will rule the nations of the earth and the nations of the earth will worship him. So when Jesus refers to himself over and over as the Son of Man, he's referencing this Daniel 7 chapter where God's intent is to put over the world a a God-man. That will, that will rule. Jesus, when he refers to himself in this way, is trying to show them that he's not like other kings and other rulers. And so here he says it plainly. So Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. In other words, they just always leverage their power to get their way. And their high officials exercise authority over them. So he's like, that's what you're wanting to do, isn't it? You want those positions. You want to be the one that lords it over. You want to be the one with power and the one with authority and that, like, the way that the Romans do. But he says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. By the way, in He uses the word slave in Greek. It's doulos. It's the lowest position in the Roman Empire. There's a hierarchy. And at the very, very bottom is the slave, not even a human. And whoever wants to be first must be slave to all. These young men, they don't want to hear this. They want power. They want authority. They want position. They want raises. They want glory. And he says, for even the Son of Man. There it is. The Son of Man, the Son of Man, the one who's to sit on the glorious throne that all of the nations will bow down and worship, the Son of Man who will reign with the Ancient of Days, who will bring justice, mercy, and goodness, who will throw the empires of the earth into the fire and raise up uh, you know, the kingdom of God. This one, he said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life away as a ransom for many, to die for the ones that he's serving. Can you do that? Can you drink that cup? Yes, we can, they say. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know the price that Jesus is asking them to pay. All of this to say that the the thing we believe as as Christians, the thing that we claim to hold on to, is the opposite of, of what the world views as power. When we talk about the hour of power, we're talking about power... That comes through being a servant of all. We're talking about a power that comes from the Holy Spirit, a power that comes from faith, a power that comes from trusting that if I love my enemies, that'll be enough. Loving your enemies is one of the best ways to show that you trust your life to God. Uh, So serving, Jesus tells us very plainly here, is the highest call of any human being is to serve others. In fact, I believe that this Avodah word teaches us that when we serve others, it becomes worship to God. What if that were true? What if in, in serving, as we call them EGRs, extra grace required people, you know, at your workplace, what if instead of doubling down, powering up, leveraging, uh, pouncing back at them, instead you served, loved, listened more, you know, maybe checked in on them later. Maybe one, remembered the last time you had a rough day and, 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 didn't want, and felt cornered or trapped. Uh, and you do that. You do that. And uh, you notice that, that the first thing that, that James and John do is they, they want titles and position. And this is the other big deception that many in society teach today is that if you have title, if you have position, that you're a leader. And that's not true. Let me just say this plainly. I mean, this is the most obvious thing I could say in the world, but leaders are not made by titles. Leaders are made by having followers. Anyone can be a leader. If people follow you, if you are influencing people, you are leading them. So let me convince you that wherever it is you work, you can be the change agent. You can be the one to bring the joy, to bring the peace, and to be this, the one who takes the jobs that nobody wants to do. That could be you, and you can make a big difference if you do that. 
See, I believe that in the church, this is where we get to practice. We get to practice with one another what it means to love people that are different than us. You know, I said earlier, this is one of the most peaceful, joyful churches I've ever been a part of, for sure. But we've got a couple crazy people. I understand that. <laughs> I understand that. I'm one of them. And, uh, you know, that's okay. And so when we're here, when we're in this environment, you know, we get the opportunity to practice um, loving one another, uh, caring for one another, serving one another. We get to, in a way, be served ourselves. We get cared for and loved on by others. But the idea is that we bring the unity of spirit, the life, the calmness, the peace uh, into the world. Uh, when we go out, we bring that sense of peace uh, with us everywhere we go. And this gets me on to heresy, something I talk a lot, a lot about in this church, heresy, you know. Just kidding, I never talk about heresy. <laughs> it's so funny how, so I just, I, I wanna, don't want to go too far off on the rabbit trail here, but did you know Paul, we always get this image that the early church was just so united and so perfect and everything was so great, and it really wasn't. I mean, Paul was writing to them, you know, talking about all sorts of stuff that was going on in the church that was crazy, and I can't even mention it in church because it's so bad. And so Paul is always working for the unity of the church, the joy of the church, the peace of the church, the, the body, not, not a Sunday morning service, but the body of believers loving one another. And actually this word that he used, uh, uh, heretic, it comes from hieratikos, it means one, one who chooses. And I just don't want to get too far on this, but the, the, the heretic under Paul's view is not the person who has false doctrine. And this is something that we miss a lot. We always think, oh, the heretic is someone who doesn't believe in the Trinity or the heretic, right? And, but a heretic under Paul's view is actually someone who causes division in the church. So very often people with a false doctrine, for example, will leverage that doctrine to cause division in the church. You know, I'm a super apostle. So you've got all of these people causing, you know, all this division in the church. Well, the, the hieratikos in all of its context that, that Paul uses it is not someone who has false doctrine. It's someone who's causing division in the church. 1 Corinthians 11, 18, 19, it's division. Titus 3, 10, the person who should be disciplined is the divisive person. And in Galatians 5, 20, this heretic he calls someone who is operating in the flesh. What does he mean by that? It's ego. Someone that's like, I was at Fuller Seminary. I've got it right. You've got it wrong. The heretic, and let me just say this very clearly, although many people split the church with false doctrine, you can have perfect doctrine and be a heretic, according to Paul. This is maybe the, one of the most, the most important thing to Paul is love. He just talks about it over and over, that we love one another. And he warns us, you know, don't preach a gospel other than the one that I preach. He says that clearly, but, but still at his heart is unity in the church, joy in the church. People who love one another because, you know, if we can do that here when we gather, we can bring that kind of compassion, um, mercy, and forgiveness to our neighbors, to our spouses, to our kids when they need it the most. And that's who you are. I'm so proud of you. We don't, we don't need to power grab. We don't need to have big egos. We don't need to stick our chests out. We can be joy bringers, peacemakers, servant leaders. At the end of the day, that's gonna, the fact that you did that at your workplace is going to matter so much more than the fact that you, you didn't get your promotion. The most important thing is going to be that you, you did what was, what was good in the eyes of the Lord and, and, and that, you, that you loved your neighbor even when they're hard to love. And I, you do that. I'm so proud of you. So just three things I would say. Very often when we talk about this servant leader type thing, it comes out as like, try harder, just try harder. But I think you can't, you can't serve what you can't cook. You know what I mean? You, you've, got to, you've got to have it on the inside of you, truly, and not just be trying harder. So the, the first thing I would say is just like, trust God with, what, with that loving your enemy is the smartest thing you can do. Trust God that that these, these ways of serving others is the best life you could ever have. I think it works its way in three ways. Number one, you just be patient. Just, just, you know, practice patience. Don't be in a hurry all the time. Don't always be thinking about the next place you got to go. Just be patient. Be, be slow. Be unhurried in your life so that you can naturally be a, a, a loving presence to people who need it. Second, be Be relaxed. Just chill out. Just relax. Relax. Our, our world is so 
tightly wound and anxious and jumping to conclusions. And you see it in politics. You definitely see it in religion. It's getting worse. We need people like you who are just chilled out, just relaxed. Uh, in fact, that, that is one of the highest definitions of a leader is probably the most relaxed person in the room. In leadership training, they often call it the non-anxious presence. If you have a room that's on fire and one guy is like, everybody calm down, follow me, this is where we're going, that's the leader. And number three, just trust God. Trust in God's providence when things don't go your way. Just trust that if you really wanted something, you're really going for it with all your heart and mind, that's good, but, but be okay if it, if it doesn't go your way. And trust, that, trust the Lord that maybe it's a grace, maybe God's got something better for you. And if you do those things, I think you're going to be able to be aware of the, the person that so many people ignore at your work and be kind and loving to them. Or, or be kind to the person that's, that's rude or steals your lunch or, or doesn't say thank you, you know, or steals the credit or whatever. We, you can just be above all that stuff. And, and you are, and I, I love you. And thank you guys for making this an amazing church. You just do it every single Sunday. You just create an awesome uh, community of loving people. And it's such a joy to be here. So Lord, we thank you. We love you. We trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.